Hey, this is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I'm back with the owner of Massive Athletics and Brute, Director of Strength and Conditioning, Nick Fowler. This show, we talk all about building strength. We go over the foundation of building a strength program, lots of different concepts like neuromuscular efficiency, and how Jacob Hepner has hit huge PRs in all of his lifts in the past eight weeks. Tons of great conceptual knowledge as well as practical. Hope you enjoy the show. Hey, this is Mike Cashew, and this is the Brute Strength Podcast. Nick, I'm excited to be back here with you, brother. Yeah, I'm excited, just like old times. Hell yeah, man. So we're gearing up for the games. Tell tell us a little bit about um, how it's going, preparing your athletes for the games. Yeah, I think it's going well. Um, It's always a time of year where, you know, stress, anxiety, the unknown, right, starts to creep in. Um, You know, I think regionals and this year's competition is just so competitive that it's starting to change the face of, of, our, of what an athlete, a games athlete kind of looks like. So I think that's starting to... What, what do you mean by that? Um, I think right now the level of, of fitness, if you will, for lack of a better term, is so high that you can't get away with not showing up every day and, and, and laying it on the line in training, in competition. I mean, you look at regionals and I mean, so many people, so many qualifications were decided on day three, mm-hmm. right? And, and in some cases by seconds, right? By places you had uh, George Sanchez, which is probably the biggest example from seventh, 36 or 35 points out, I could be wrong, but, and then making the fifth spot. So mm-hmm. if you're not showing up and training every day, um, mentally, physically, psychologically prepared, you're just behind the eight ball. And I think that's the, the group of athletes that we're seeing. Right. Yeah. People have to be, they actually have to be professionals. Yeah. Right. They have to be eating correctly, uh, preparing correctly, recovering correctly, doing all of the little things that a couple of years ago, maybe three or four years ago, weren't as important. You can kind of just train, you know, three or four hours a day and then make it in if you're, if you're talented enough. But now every single person has to be a, an actual professional. Yeah, the bar's been raised. Yeah, for sure. So today I want to talk about building strength. Um, and I want, to, I want to start it off by talking about one of our athletes, Jacob Hepner, who came to us as, you know, he had just placed sixth at the games. And we knew that without a doubt, the biggest thing he needed to do was increase his one rep maxes, right? He had a, uh, yeah, get, get him stronger and he's got a real shot at winning the CrossFit Games. So <clears throat> what was the conversation like with him being that he's someone that absolutely loves having a high workload and, and really thrives on that and you knowing that in order to get significantly stronger, something is going to have to give in that programming. So first off, how did you approach that first conversation with him to explain that? Yeah, I think the first conversation was, uh, in, in my impression, from my perspective, was just a, a couple peers, like a set of peers coming together, brainstorming, saying, hey, what do you need? Right? He's a smart guy. He, you know, in years past, he's programmed for himself. He's done extremely well, sixth place at the games. Like, that's not something that, you know, shy away from. And so <clears throat> you have somebody who uh, is really, really smart, huge knowledge base, big experience. And so uh, I think coming together and saying, okay, what can we do together? Like what aspects need to change? Um, and for me, just knowing enough about him from a competitor standpoint, it was, it's pretty obvious, right? So um, talking about you know what he had been doing um, and times that he had gotten stronger and times that he had seen success in, in, in those priorities uh, and just slowly starting to uh, honestly just build trust, right? So in the beginning, it wasn't uh, any kind of, you know, big uh, claims or predictions or like change in plan. It was like, okay, this is what you're doing. Let's go ahead and match it. And then uh, we'll get through some testing mm-hmm. and we'll slowly adjust over time, which um, that's what we've been doing. And right now, I mean, if you if you see him lately, he's just, I mean, every week is a new PR. I think he just hit 350 for a jerk, uh, maybe even a, yeah, a jerk. And then he, he overhead squatted like 365, 375 mm-hmm. yep. or something. So, yeah, he's hitting PRs 
uh, weekly. He's been hitting PRs weekly for over a month now. <clears throat> yeah. It's been amazing. And so at the end of this show, I want to I want to get into like specifically what his programming looks like today. Love it. But first <clears throat> off, I, I want to set like a really good foundation for people that uh, aren't familiar with strength programming. So when you're when you're thinking about writing a program to get someone stronger, where where does your mind start? Uh, and just give us some of the basics, if you will. Yeah. So um, it's it's kind of a my mind doesn't really start anywhere. It's more of I, I need to collect data, right? And so some of the things that go into that are going to be training history. Like what did you do growing up as a sport, right? It's very different than if you um, ran long distance track. Right, versus played football. And even the position that you played in football is going to determine how you're built a little bit. Uh, how you're built is very important because it defines um, or it, it plays a big part in how we react to certain strength protocols, if that makes sense. So certain strength protocols uh, will work for a powerful athlete uh, where they would not work as well as, as an enduring athlete. Um, so training history, like how old the, the athlete is, biological age, uh, injuries a little bit. I think about um, where their current numbers are. And then I go into um, movement quality. So I look at my approach is, is a ground up approach. So mobility, movement, structure. And I look at those first. And because those are the biggest, I think in, in elite athletes, those are the biggest chinks in people's armor right mm -hmm. now. And it's, um, it's what's going to create that ceiling first. Gotcha. if you will, right? So um, so that's where I start. And then from there, going to, you know, a bunch of, uh, like, assessment and testing uh, periods sometimes, you know, I mean, with uh, with some folks, it's, it's a solid four weeks that we dedicate. Um, some folks, it's just two weeks. Other folks, um, we go into a training cycle, and I insert tests, and it really just depends on, on the individual. But uh, those are the things that I'm asking myself, right, is like what type of athlete this is. Um, and then we start our testing to figure out uh, a little bit more detail into that. Gotcha. So let's just pick. So obviously you can create, um, you know, dozens of different avatars or, or different types of athletes based on all of those results. Let's yep. just pick one. And let's say it's someone like Jacob who, you know, is a male, played some sports in, in high school, maybe college, and then got into doing CrossFit. So moves well, uh, has a, you know, training age of over four years because he's been lifting in high school and college um, and, and doing some CrossFit. W what, then what? What's the next step for you building a strength program for that athlete? Yeah, so I would look at um, all the lifts. And so I know that um, I want your deadlift uh, within a certain percentage of your front squat, within a certain percentage of your back squat, within a certain percentage of your overhead squat, right? Um, I want to know that... Do you know those percentages off the top of your head? Yeah, so um, as, as a baseline, um, I would just say structural balance piece, um, I want uh, your deadlift at 125% of your back squat, and I want your front squat at 85% of your back squat, just some examples, right? Yep. And um, the sport is changing, and anytime you get sport specific, those numbers kind of get skewed. And you look at powerlifters, right, who can um, squat more than they deadlift, right? right? So uh, it, it doesn't hold true to sport specific stuff, but that's, that's where I, I start, right? Um, single leg strength, right? Is one leg stronger than the other? Are there deficiencies like valgus knee? Um, are the glutes firing? Uh, you'd be surprised how many high level athletes, um, you know, can't externally rotate or create power in external rotation using their glutes and hamstrings, right? Relative to other things. Mm -hmm. Not to say they can't do it, but uh, other pieces of their structure are stronger, right? And so, um, you know, in high level athletes, it might not develop or manifest into an injury, but it will manifest into limitations, mm -hmm. right? Performance limiters. Gotcha. So, so then you determine where all of those numbers are, right? What, what their structural balance is, if you will. That's yeah. kind of what you're talking about. I want to make sure that there's no um, real big deficiencies that, that, um, that kind of stand out. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and so for, for the avatar you mentioned, someone like Jake, he, um, you know, overhead pressing, overhead stability is kind of what came out, right? Um, scapular strength things like that. So if you have someone with overhead stability, um, 
priorities or limitations, uh, weaknesses, then it's not just a matter of like, hey, let's just do more overhead stuff, right? Like the shoulder capsule, uh, you know, overhead pressing movements are complex, right? You have a mobility c component with uh, the scapula that needs to move in a certain way to allow a range of motion. Um, and then you have, you know, all the muscle structures around that. And then you have to ask yourself, well, is it also existent when you invert the athlete because it changes, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> so looking at those things, assuming that, um, you know, there's no big glaring um, holes or, or structural imbalances, then I go into um, just priorities, like what numbers do we need to get up, right? And so if, if we're talking about strength, right, so it makes it really easy. Strength is a, is a very, very simple thing to talk about because um, there's a lot of tang tangible things there. If we talked about energy systems, it's like, like so much more complex, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not even uh, talking about how energy system work influences um, strength adaptations, right? So you can blunt strength adaptations just by too much metabolic damage, too much breathing, too much uh, aerobic threshold work um, in some people. In mm -hmm. other people, it, it actually helps with adaptation. So, um, so uh, that being said, you know, right, like there's, no, there's no big glaring uh, you know, structural imbalances. I look at what type of athlete they are, right? I, I try to, in my mind, in a very, very simple way, I'm, I ask the question, are they enduring or are they powerful? And that's gonna set up the beginning of this exploration of what strength protocols are most likely gonna work. Mm -hmm. And so for an enduring person, um, which, you know, uh, the avatar that you mentioned. I think a, a better avatar, uh, more extreme, um, could just be, um, j just so um, maybe the point is very clear, could be, let's just say we have a female athlete, uh, regional level, um, who uh, ran track and did some gymnastics, like, you know, growing up. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that, that avatar right there, um, I, would, I would consider, uh, and, and let's just assume that that person is enduring, right? So the, the, the longer workouts go, the better they are. That's like a very simple um, way to identify that. It's also, you can also take, um, and this is where you have to kind of test some energy systems to get an idea. So you're gonna look at like a 30 second max calorie, a 60 second, a three minute, and like a 10 minute max calorie on the aerodyne, you're gonna see uh, kind of where their strengths lie. A lot of times you can just tell through um, talking with them. And so once you set this up, right, enduring or powerful, <clears throat> the powerful person you can think about needs less of a dose response than the enduring person to get, to get that, their system stressed, right? And it's the stress of that that creates an adaptation. So. Um, it's the difference between giving someone, in a very, very simple term, right, two reps versus 10 reps. If you have a power lifter and you just think about, you know, think about the power lifter that bleeds from their nose when they do like a two, a two rep max or mm -hmm. something, right? Um, that is a powerful man or woman. And so if you were to give that, that athlete, that person, eight reps, you would like blow them up, destroy them. Like the amount of stress and their, the sensitivity of their central nervous system, like all that stuff, um, it would be through the roof, it'd be too much. So you're gonna overdose them. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with an enduring person, right? We take that avatar of the female uh, long distance track. Um, and so who, who we're assuming is enduring and in, in in her essence, um, if you give her two repetitions, it might not be enough of a stress to create an adaptation. There's a lot of ways to play with that stress and increase it through time under tension, uh, sets, reps, um, even just um, how you set up uh, progression, whether you're gonna wave load something or you're mm -hmm. gonna go linear. So there's a lot of creativity there, but that's essentially kind of what I just start to try to figure out, powerful or enduring. Okay, and I, I actually want to get specifically into that creativity in a second. Love it. But first, what we're talking about 
we call that neuromuscular efficiency, right? Where we're, we're looking at uh, how neuromuscular efficient they are, what, how many reps of their one rep they can do. Yep. Can you t- tell them the specific tests that we give our athletes to tell, you know, yeah, to, for to sure. identify that? Yeah, so the, the NME or, or neuromuscular efficiency test. Um, so um, just to set a little bit of context here, um, you know, this has been developed by uh, a whole bunch of different uh, coaches in the past. Uh, Poliquin used it uh, and, and kind of I've adapted it as one of a primary assessment tools because I think that neuro, someone's neuromuscular efficiency or sensitivity, you could say, um, is a huge key piece to what strength protocols are going to work. And so if you think about someone's neuro, you can have a, you can have someone who is Uh, has a high neuromuscular efficiency, meaning that they're very efficient. So you can think about this person's just titrating in signals from the brain. So what we're talking about is the signal from the brain to muscles to create contractions, right? So you have the highly efficient athlete, which is typically an enduring athlete. It's common in females. Females are typically higher Mm -hmm. neuromuscular, uh, higher enemy. And so you have basically this uh, limiter, right, the governor in, in the system that's just giving a little bit at a time. So you can, uh, there's less signal, less force being created, but you can sustain that for a much longer time, okay? Then you have... Um, so just to, be, just to really spell it out for people, this is the, the, these are the people that can do, you know, eight reps at 92.5%, right? Like a, a, a ton of reps at a very, very high percentage versus the person that, can do, that has a really, really high one rep max. Totally. Right? The classic example is if you ever see uh, someone bench press and um, you, know, you see them benching and you're like, hey, work up to a two rep heavy and it doesn't look hard, mm-hmm. right? And, and like the difference between uh, being able to do like, this person can do 10 reps at 100 pounds and then all of a sudden it's like, you know, two reps at 110 pounds. Like, it just doesn't make sense. And you're like, you need to try harder. Like, mm-hmm. come on. Like, but it, it's just, it has nothing to do with will, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. So, um, so that's a highly efficient person. The, the, the opposite end of the spectrum, you can think about that power lifter I mentioned earlier, right? Where like one rep and they're done, right? Like there is no governor. Like you do something and it's like almost this like vomiting of like signals. It's just like everything at once and then you're done. Right, so those are the extreme ends. And so um, knowing how that works and the influence and how that plays is, is like I said before, a, a, a key component to setting up successful protocols. Um, the test that we, that we run, you can, you can do it in multiple different ways. Uh, you can do it with uh, a bunch of different lifts to look at specifics, but generally what, um, what I've found to be a very good predictor is you just uh, work up to a one rep max back squat and then you uh, after that you're going to rest for 10 minutes and then you're going to complete max reps at 85 percent and so <clears throat> the the tempo in which you do this is very important right so you want to have a controlled eccentric lower and then come on up in your one rep max and in the basically the max set and so you don't want to do one sit there for three seconds catch your breath do one again you have to stick to a very strict tempo mm-hmm. and basically that sets up uh, a window into what how they're they're built neurologically so you have people who if um, you can only get two in that max set you would be low efficient if that makes sense so 85 percent represents two repetitions, right? So it takes you two repetitions to create an 85% stress. And, and I'll explain what that means and how it goes into kind of the bigger picture. And then you have other people who um, take that same 85% can do 10, 12 reps. And it's, in, I mean, it's insane when you see it. They, the two people can be just as strong. Let's just hypothetically say they both uh, squat um, you know, 300 pounds, and one person gets two and the other person gets 10, right? Like, um, obviously, a um, highly efficient person is better for, um, for more muscle endurance-based um, sports, and then the power lifter you kind of want on the, the low end, mm-hmm. right? 
And so <clears throat> what that says, and you can just envision it, right? So if you say, uh, what's the classic uh, recipe for strength, right? Like a five by five at 80%, right? 85%. Well, <clears throat> you're gonna overdose the, the person who is low efficient, right? The person who gets two reps, the power lifter, you're gonna ask them to do five sets, like they're gonna blow up. And then you ask the, the highly efficient person to do a five by five at 85%, and you're gonna underdose them. They need 10, 12 reps to even get a stimulus out of that training, right? So, so this is where um, the art of building strength really comes in. It's not just like, oh, five, three, one, let's do that. Not that those are bad programs. I mean, they work for you know, a bunch of people that are created for very specific reasons, but um, I think it's important to ask ourselves um, when I do X, how is my body responding? And this is just one way to look at it. Mm -hmm. So in that model, with, with, the, you know, with the information of what, uh, what, what someone's NME is, right? they do that test, then, wh then where do you go? Right? What kind of protocol do you give that person based on their neuromuscular efficiency? Yeah, so the, the question is, is what type of strength do we want to create in them? Right, and let's just for I mean, there's you know speed strength, there's strength speed, there's um, you know all these different types of strength. Let's just say for argument's sake, it's absolute strength that we're trying to create in somebody. And so, if we're trying to create absolute strength, one rep maxes versus like um, the ability to do 85 percent, 65 percent. Right, those are different types of strength. So people think about strength as like how much can I lift maximally. Mm -hmm when, um, depending on the sport you're playing, there might be a bigger value in uh, strength speed, right? Or speed strength or something along that continuum. Mm -hmm. So um, if it's building absolute strength, the first thing I say is, okay, okay, well, I need to give um, the highly efficient person more reps, right? So the whole five by five is not gonna work for them, right? And so you can give that person eight to 10 reps and it will feel like, and it will create adaptations in theory, like the person getting a five by five who's normal, has a normal uh, enemy, mm -hmm. right? And so <clears throat> the you know, strength continuum, right, where we're talking about, oh, absolute strength is built between one and three reps, right? And then you have functional strength and then you have uh, you know, uh, relative strength, then you have, um, you know, muscle endurance and then hypertrophy. Well, those... Well, um, vice versa. Hypertrophy, muscle endurance, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm just naming... Okay, Yeah, gotcha, I'm not gotcha. naming them order, so like relative would be different. Gotcha. So don't, those aren't in order for gotcha. sure. Um, but all those characteristics are set up on a continuum, right? So they're saying, um, you know, hypertrophy is eight to 10 reps, right? In some, I mean, you look at textbooks, right? And then hypertrophy is like 15 to 20, um, I'm kind of broad, turns, depends on where you look, right? Um, and so all of a sudden, if you take that individual's neuromuscular efficiency, uh, then in th based on textbooks, right, that eight to 10 reps is going to build what? It's gonna build hypertrophy, right? But for someone who is highly efficient, that might build absolute strength for them, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So there's certain things that set up um, and adjust that continuum. Okay, neuromuscular efficiency is one. Um, training age, right? If someone is new to lifting, um, it's they're gonna um, their connections in their brain, the central nervous system, neurologically, they're not firing. They don't have those patterns set, and so they're gonna be weaker. They're weaker in terms of like uh, highly efficient, right? Because they haven't learned how to give those forceful, uh, you know, uh, signals yet. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially. The, the, the characteristics that typically set up somebody for a higher efficiency are females. Um, and again, it, higher, lower, it's not better or worse. Um, it's just how you're built, and so you just need to adjust how you're training. Now, certain sports, uh, you'll benefit from being on one side or the other. But So females, uh, low training age, so someone who doesn't have a lot of experience. That's why you see the brand new person come in and bench press with that example I gave earlier. Um, you're gonna have uh, basically training history. So if they come from endurance sports, they're typically gonna be more, uh, you know, they're gonna be on that high end. Mm -hmm. um, 
And those are, those are kind of the things. You have biological age, which actually reverses it. So the older we get, the more sensitive we get uh, to, uh, to the stresses of strength training, right? So you think about a master's athlete who's you know, 65 years old versus a 21-year-old. 65-year-old needs less to create a sense, of, to, to create that stress for those adaptations than the 21-year-old. What are, so what, what, where can people find out more about the, uh, the enemy and then we'll move on? Google Poliquin in yeah. neuromuscular efficiency? Yeah, Poliquin Strength Principles is probably a really good book if you mm-hmm. haven't read it. Um, it's, it's definitely a, a one of um, a books that made a huge influence on me and mm-hmm. he talks a lot about how to adjust those things and how it affects it. So, um, that nowadays, I mean, neuromuscular efficiency and ME tests aren't um, new anymore. So I'm sure if you Google it, you'll get a bunch of like, you know, PDFs, blogs that people have written and things like that. Um, but Poliquin is, is where I would start. Maybe. And then what are a couple other resources that, like, like basic resources you would recommend people dive in to get their feet wet uh, with programming? Oh, man. Um, I think Mel Siff's super training is outstanding it's not basic yeah it's but it's <laughs> but a heady it, book totally but it's it's like a more of an encyclopedia mm-hmm. right so like if you want to learn about something you can go into that book um that's probably the the other book that i would recommend unfortunately there's not a lot out there um you know you have the academic side of things um which i think allows somebody to set a foundation but it's the empirical experience that really needs to define how you're using that knowledge. And mm-hmm. I think that, that those, really those pieces are underdeveloped, you know? Um, yeah, no, uh, uh, practical programming is another, like, yes. very basic, you know, much easier read. Yeah. And then, honestly, I learned so much about programming from T Nation. Mm-hmm. Just Googling T Nation and, and uh, coaches that I looked up to, and there's just an endless amount of different protocols that that you can play around with. And, and what I've learned, and when I, what, when I talk to you know, some of the, the coaches I look up to the most, such as yourself, it's all about experimentation and, and actually experiencing those different types of protocols for yourself, right? You have to see what effects these different protocols have in your athletes to be able to really comprehend uh, the, their, their greater effect and then how to use them in the future. 100%. I think that's the key to being a successful coach. It, and, and, and that takes um, being uncomfortable, mm-hmm. not knowing. Right, so everything we've talked about is is really just. Um, I've seen enough examples to where, like, if I see something, I'm like, okay, like these protocols are probably going to work. But sometimes I mess it up, right? Like, I'm like, oh, this is going to work, and it doesn't. I'm like, why isn't this working? And then I find out, kind of after digging, right? So it's like the ability to kind of see what's going on, assess it, take that information, take that information, upgrade what you're doing, and then kick it out. Right. See what happens. Right. Absorb that information. So it's that's really the process, the true process of coaching. Right. Right. Um, and I think it's um, it's honestly the, the enjoyable part. Right. I mean, we're dealing with human beings. Um, we're not dealing with everyone's different. It's like an N equals one experiment every single time. Um, if the person only lived in the gym and those are the only variables, it would be more predictable. But sleep patterns, stress, um, just hormonal profiles, like genetics, like um, your age, uh, you know, the type of food you eat, the region that you live in, right? Like if you live uh, in the Pacific Northwest, um, how is the lack of sunlight, vitamin D affecting what you're doing mm-hmm. versus like someone who lives in near the equator, right? So th- those are just some examples of some, just uh, how every, um, it's not a, one size fits all, um, we can get really, really close with just um, knowing, you know, enduring people, powerful people, um, and needing some priorities, and then coming to the table with, um, you know, strength protocols that, that work, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's back up for a second. Can you explain to people kind of the principles of what 
we're actually trying to accomplish with strength programming, so such yeah. as super compensation, uh, what a deload is, and stuff like that. Yeah, so, so great question. Yeah, regardless of the protocol, what things need to be present? Yeah, so I think um, um, so super compensation, right? What needs to actually happen for you to get stronger, fitter, faster, is you need to stress your body. And then you need to recover from that stress, okay? And in recovering from that stress, you, your level of fitness increases, strength, speed, whatever you want to call it. And so um, it goes back to the example of overdosing and underdosing, right? If you overdose on what are you going to you know, stress them too much and they won't be able to recover, right? And if the goal is to recover um, past that initial baseline, maybe you can't do it. Right, where there's not enough time before your session. next training session, right? Yeah, yeah, and so that's the key. Uh, and then if you don't stress them enough, you're going to blunt or slow down their progress, right? You're going to make small jumps instead. So uh, that's just one example of like how to apl apply the NME example in, in terms of reps. So you need to stress the body. And then here's a big piece that I think um, is coming around. People are more in tune with how they're recovering and the importance of recovery, but uh, that is, I, I always, I tell my athletes that, um, you know, it, the conversation's about training, and I need to do this in training, and I want to focus this on training, and I want to do more of this, or if they have to take a rest day, I'm like, oh, I'm not, I'm, getting, I'm missing out on training, right? And I think that there's a shift happening, and this is what I encourage, is that training is recovery, right? Is mobility, is nutrition, right? Like, all that, what is training? Training is there to help you improve your fitness, right? Your, your, right? your physical capacity, whatever it is. And so um, it's a very uh, singular, incomplete view. And so recovery needs to be there. That's a whole different conversation in itself. But um, the beauty about it is that if you, if you have a, a well thought out program and you're stretching yourself, if you can recover from that, that's how you get stronger. Right. right. Recovery can happen in a bunch of different ways. Think about how we stress our bodies. We stress our bodies um, psychologically, right? Central nervous system, uh, our neuroanatomy is very, very complex. Uh, and then physically, muscle structures, joint structures. Um, and I call it, it's like the difference between hardware and software. So we have our software that we stress and we have our hardware that we stress. Both of those need to be considered, right? So um, for the software, right? Um, neuromuscular efficiency, or, sorry, um, just our neuroanatomy, um, central nervous system, like that's what I call our software. Um, there are certain things you can do to recover that. Carbohydrates post-training, right, high glycemic stuff. Um, you can think about guided breathing, meditation, journal writing. Um, I mean, there's so many things out there. Even, even rolling out and body work, like rolling out the physical mashing of your muscles will... Uh, foster a parasympathetic state. Mm -hmm. um, so parasympathetic being relaxed, reju rejuvenating, right? Sympathetic, fight or flight, like I'm going to die, heart rate elevates, just two different things, right? So uh, in training, we stimulate typically the, the sympathetic. And so in uh, recovery, we want to kind of cultivate a parasympathetic system. Um, for the physical, that could be uh, cool downs and warm ups in your training. So making sure that you just don't hit your training really hard and then like leave the gym five minutes later, your body's like in shock being like, oh my God, just what happened, right? And it's just trying to reach equilibrium again. The quicker you can help it reach its equi equilibrium, the better it's going to be, the more efficient it's going to be at recovering. So um, you can think about circulation, blood flow, like oxygenating lo local muscle structures, right? Like, um, so at least get 10 minutes of spinning in, right? That's the time to do mobility, right? Mm -hmm. You can do your body work in. So there's all these things you can do to help recovery, but that is where the magic happens. Yeah, people forget that, you know, we're the whole, our whole experience of like this fitness journey is about creating an adaptation, right? And it's stress plus recovery equals adaptation. All people want to focus on is the stress side because that's the that's the measurable stuff. Sexy, right? Yes. So it, it's it's uh, it's so cool to see people like the aha moment that they have when 
the only change we make is more recovery, less stress, right? They're doing less than ever before, but they're hitting PRs, they're feeling better throughout the day, all because they're finally giving them their bodies time to recover from that stress. Completely. What do you think when people say, I'm just gonna do powerlifting for a while, and then I'm gonna get back into CrossFit or weightlifting or, or whatever it may be? I mean, there's you know, with the goal with their their goal is to compete in CrossFit. Yeah, I think that's a mistake. Um, I think people compartmentalize their training, and then this is what you see kind of cannibalizing protocols, programs, right? Like, oh, I got to work on my gymnastics. I'm going to do this over here, and I'm going to I'm going to work on my my breathing. So, I'm going to go do these running protocols, and then I'm going to go, um, you know. I had a really interesting question the other day from uh, one of the knowledge bombs that I put out. Someone commented saying, hey, like, um, they wanted to understand how, what's the best way to peak for a competition. And they asked the question, and I'm paraphrasing here, whether a 531 protocol would be better or a more traditional, like, Olympic lifting program. And <clears throat> my answer was, like, well, what? What do you need? So if you think about Olympic lifting, fast movement, fast twitch, like explosive power development, 531, slow strength, things like that. So if you are faster than you are stronger, meaning like you lack uh, you know, raw strength, but you can move quickly, mm -hmm. then maybe the 531 is a little bit more applicable, right? So like, uh, and the opposite is true for the Olympic lifting. So going back to your question, like, you know, the person who chooses powerlifting, just asking yourself, well, what's that doing? And you're still leaving 80% of stuff off the table, right? right. So um, if we don't develop uh, individually or independently. Um, we're like, we can't come over here and develop this piece and then come over here and develop this piece. We're, we're much more complex than that, and everything influences one another. The beauty about that is you can actually use energy system training and protocols to help develop absolute strength or speed strength, right, or whatever it is. So you can actually, the, if you do it intelligently, you can put in all the pieces you need, and they will actually work together, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, so I think it's a big mistake. I think... I think um, there's a way to do it where you can, you know, have your cake and eat it too. Right. And then there are, my answer is usually weightlifting we know is, that, you know, the snatch, the clean, and the jerk are three of the most important movements in all of CrossFit. They're tested the most. Um, you know, the squat and deadlift are definitely tested, but these are Go, go, going to be tested even more. So I would rather see you follow a weightlifting program that's in a, a strength building phase, right? That, out, that has a lot of practice, right? A lot of lightweight technical practice in the movements um, that, that is geared towards getting you stronger rather than doing a ton of box squatting and, and squatting with chains and focusing entirely on building strength without continuing to practice the, the movements because it's, the, it's just so technical I hate seeing people take such amounts of time off from practicing those movements. Yeah. Yeah, and I agree. And, and that's the interesting thing about CrossFit that you mentioned, right? So, like, it's one of the few sports where training is the sport, you know? And so, um, it. You mean the training in the gym is the sport? The, yeah, like. Because training foot in football is, is the sport, but the, the training in the gym is just supplementary. No, no, no. So, like, training in football, right, if you're going to go in, run on a treadmill, whatever, that's not the sport. You're training physical adaptations. Oh, I guess our definitions of training are different. Yeah, so I think about gym training. Gotcha. Right? Uh, like, in football, the, the sport is on the field. Mm -hmm. and, and then you could classify that as training, too, but I'm just saying gym training, right? So they're separate, right? You're developing characteristics over here, and you're, you're practicing and refining skills mm -hmm. over here. CrossFit, it's kind of all jumbled up, and it... It tends to make people crazy um, because uh, defining themselves, success, failure uh, on a daily basis is, is emotionally just, I mean, you talk about the upheaval that happens, right? And so um, the way I look at things is that you, and this is my goal, right, as a coach, 
with my athletes, and this this will tie back into uh, Jacob at the end here, but um, I look at characteristics in people. And so if you have the ability to move something quickly, right, and generate power and explosiveness, it doesn't matter if that's a barbell, a kettlebell, or a dumbbell, right, or a sled. Mm -hmm. The Right, so that's the characteristic. That's the, the adaptations that we're going after. That's the, um, the beauty about training and what I love. When you look on the other side of things, right, then, so then I just mentioned barbell, kettlebell, dumbbell, sled. We can develop those skills either in conjunction mm -hmm. with those characteristics or separately, right? So that's the thing about CrossFit is like, what's coming out of the games in a week? Well, we know a couple things, but the rest is just up in the air. I mean, mm -hmm. you look at, um, you look at, regionals this past year and it's like oh my god there's no barbells well if and I'll say this with a grain of salt but if you've been training correctly and smart you should have the characteristics that allow you to lift heavy kettlebells or a barbell or an axle bar right or whatever um, the characteristics are the things that we're training so if you look at the sport of CrossFit if you look at regionals um, the games is tough, but the open and regionals, the characteristics are very, very similar. Mm -hmm. You need very similar characteristics so far. It could all change next year uh, from one year to the next. So you can develop those. And then on the side, you can focus on the skills. Right. Yeah. So for people that they want, they want to get stronger, but they, they can't afford to completely lose their conditioning, um, actually, I'll back up. We know the recipe to building strength is lift, rest, repeat, right? For a lot of people listening to this show, a lot of CrossFitters, uh, and really a lot of people in, in general sports, they have to do uh, a level of conditioning, whether it be you know track work or it's pr uh, practice or something like that. What are, what are some of the things that they should keep in mind in their programming, such as you want to rest 72 hours after your, you know, your highest intensity work, work set or something like that? What are, what are some of the things they need to watch out for in their overall training plan? Um, yeah, so I think um, in an ideal world, you want to look at, again, the software and the hardware, and you want to have adequate rest. So typically... Um, you know, you can train a muscle group every 36 hours um, with it kind of fully recovering for most people. Now you have people who are training 17 times a week and you just can't protect structures and you know, you just can't do it. Um, and so there, there's a lot of things in play there that allow them to get better even though, you know, maybe that's not happening. So, um, um, so, you have that right if you for anaerobic work that's not building lactate so speed stuff so like you know about aerosol stuff at like eight seconds you can think about um you know just high output um really really low time you can recover within 12 to 24 hours so you can do that stuff pretty frequently aerobic stress like th true aerobic stress can take up to 72 hours to 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 recover from. So here's the thing, right? Is, is that if I told you, hey, we're gonna we're gonna be doing dumbbell curls every day because you want guns, mm -hmm. right? Like anybody out there would just be like, that's crazy. Like you need a rest day, right? Like your muscles are not gonna be able to recover. Well, the same thing goes into your aerobic system, right? You have, I mean, just at a very very basic level, you have a heart that is a muscle. And granted, it's, it's built a little bit differently and everything, but if you're saying, oh, I'm going to breathe heavy and do threshold work every single day, somehow that's accepted, right? Um, and we're just not going to allow ourselves to recover. It doesn't mean you can't do something every day, but it needs to be very different, mm -hmm. right, to allow. So you can do, uh, you know, aerosol sprints one day, then you can, um, or here, let's just say um, threshold work one day, like, one like 2k repeats right nasty times six the next day you can do those aerosol sprints right and then the day after you can do some easy breathing 
um, like zone one work. I'd probably flip those, to be honest with you. But And then all of a sudden, that's three days. And then on the fourth day, maybe you rest, and then you're back to threshold work. So then you've given yourself the 72 hours. So um, I know that um, when we program flow sessions, and Henshaw has you know his progressions in there, like it takes all that into account, right? Like we need different types of breathing. So that's the first thing, I think, is that knowing that um, you know, the aerobic system is a lot more complex than just breathing hard. Um, and that's where um, I think that if you set that up correctly, it can really help with strength protocols. Okay. And what, what, it, what, yeah, what are some of the biggest things that people need to watch out for, such as doing a, a, you know, a 20 minute AMRAP directly after their five sets of three at 90%? Um, is there anything that comes to mind there? I mean, not, not, not specifically. It's, uh, what do you mean? Could, could talk a little more about that. So for, for instance, one thing I know is that we want to, we want to stay away from doing, um, a lot of conditioning right after hypertrophy work, mm -hmm. right? Because that's, just, that's going to send very mixed signals to our body and kind of destroy that stimulus. Is there anything else like that in building strength? I think we have to revisit our avatars mm -hmm. because it, it'll set up differently. So the person who has super high neuromuscular efficiency, um, that type of work does, would do really well in that scenario, mm -hmm. right? Where like, um, you have, and, and I think that's one reason why you see women um, who are just jacked, right? And everyone's like, oh, they got to be on something. Well, no, they're not. They just, the type of training um, really um, suits them, right? Like um, high repetition, high level of contractions actually um, builds strength, if that mm -hmm. makes sense, and capacity. So um, I, don't, I don't look at it as... Um, black and white like that I think about um, if you're a powerful person yeah like that is a recipe for just disaster right because um, you're going to go into that 20 minute AMRAP fatigued central nervous system is going to be beat down so what intensity can you actually bring mm -hmm. right um, for an enduring person maybe those uh, that 5x5 five five as an example might just be a warm up and might get their system fired up to actually get more out of the 20 minute AMRAP Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, un unfortunately, like the biggest answer is it kind of just depends, right? Um, so I think if you're an enduring person, right, and you're on that high side of NME, neuromuscular efficiency, um, you're going to um, get a different response. You're going to train a different system in that 20-minute AMRAP of like, you know, 30 wall balls, um, you know, 20 burpees, 20 chest to bar, I'm just making it up, right? Like high density stuff, muscle endurance stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that for someone on the highly efficient side is going to get stressed in a very different way versus that really, really powerful person coming into a training session like that. Right. right? Um, and so that's the thing is it's, 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 um, if, <clears throat> if you do a, you know, if, if you, if you do a set of pull-ups and I do a set of pull-ups, I might stop and drop because of my breathing and you might stop because of grip, right? And so at, at that point we're training two different systems, you and I, if that makes sense. And so just because we're doing the same thing doesn't mean we are creating the same adaptations. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. So now let's talk about uh, what Jacob Hepner's programming looks like a little bit. He's, uh, you know, to, just to bring it back to how we started, he's putting on, um, he's hitting PRs all over the place. I think he just hit like a 20 pound plus jerk PR. How do you, you know, tell us some of the similarities to what you just shared with us, yeah. like how it fits into his current programming and, and also some of the things that you have to keep in mind due to, um, the fact that he just loves to have a very high workload. Yeah, it's it's hard to manage. Um, and honestly, the first thing in there is trust. And I feel like you know, been working with Jacob for a while, and, and um, you know, every week, every month, you know, over the past however long, we've I've been fortunate enough to gain his trust. I feel like, um, and vice versa. And so, 
when we have a conversation and I put something down on paper for it, he's trusts the process. So I think, you know, just with any coach athlete relationship, that has to be at the heart of it. It doesn't mean he has to agree with it. It doesn't mean we have conversations about changing it. It just means that like, if we agree to do what's on paper, then that's what's happening. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and in the beginning, you know, I, I, I didn't want to give him the volume that he wanted, but I gave it to him because that's what's worked in the past and that's what he needed. Right. And so, um, right now, uh, you know, so, so back in two weeks before the open, right. He, you know, just basically walking lunges, took his knee, like hit the ground too hard and like burst a sack, mm -hmm. right. Just kind of pop like totally fluke. Like, I mean, who knows? Right. And so that took him out of the 2017 season. Um, he didn't, he just couldn't recover from that quick enough to go into the open. I think it was like the third week, second week in the open when he started feeling better. But so what that set up for us is a new conversation. So for me, I think about timelines and for, for Jacob, it's, it's the games, right? We got to prep, you know, train through the open, prep for regionals, but he's training for the games. And so right now we're a year out. And so when we had that conversation initially, it was like, this is a great opportunity, right? Like if he was training for the games, right? He'd be breathing hard, high, you know, high level contractions in terms of muscle endurance, like metabolic damage um, in aerobic stuff would be high. And for him, he's an enduring athlete. Like he is, uh, and if, if you know him, um, you've seen him compete, his, um, his ability to go long is probably the best, one of the best in the game, mm -hmm. right? Um, but you get him on a sprint ladder with cleans, deadlifts, like that's where he, that's where his priorities currently lay. And so <clears throat> knowing that, um, it's really hard for him to get strong. So he is, he has a, a high enemy, right? His neuromuscular efficiency is pretty high. So I know that um, like high level of contractions with time under tension is going to what, what's going to make him strong. Now there's a little bit more to that in there, but basically what this has allowed is an opportunity to find the protocols that really work for Jacob. Um, he is a complex athlete. He's a high level athlete to assume that I can come to the table and be like, Hey, here's this protocol. You're going to get strong is, I mean, it just doesn't work like that. Um, I can say, Hey, here are these protocols. We're going to try them out. Let's see what happens. Um, and we can refine it. And that's what we've been able to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of it has just been, uh, a lot more than what you see on Instagram and what you see out there, right? We've been working, I mean, just as a simple example is overhead stability, right? Like scapular um, mobility, scapular strength, um, external rotation in the shoulder. Um, also, uh, you know, the anterior pelvic tilt that you see him squat with um, has dramatically improved. And then if he's able to stack his hips over his shoulders, like, performance gains right but people don't think about that that's the those are the structural pieces the structural holes that I'm talking about like with high level athletes and so um, this has allowed us to take time there so mm -hmm. in a nutshell um, we found uh, basically we took six weeks and we six to eight weeks and we ran a protocol for his um, overhead stability and his overhead pressing and that's what you see right now it's the you know eight weeks after the fact this is the results of right. what we've built and so we just talked uh, a couple of weeks ago about saying okay it's working like we we're like hey this is what we're doing we're building up eight week site so, you know we're gonna run uh, this for eight weeks and then we're gonna test you and we tested him and it was just like bam you know like crazy gains like awesome so we're like okay cool we're gonna take those protocols and now we're gonna implement them uh, system wide, mm -hmm. right? Um, we haven't really touched his deadlift. We really haven't touched his front squat. If I were to try to do all of it at once, um, and let's just say it succeeded, it worked, I, it would be really hard for me to figure out what 
succeeded or mm-hmm. what worked. If it didn't work, I'd be in the same boat. I'd be like, man, right? So picking one thing and really working on that um, has really allowed us, Jacob and I, to figure out, okay, this is what works to get yeah. you strong. Um, and so that wouldn't have happened without this time of year, this off season. And, and it's tough because if you compete in the games, uh, the month of August is kind of a reset. So then you're starting September and you really only have two or three months of training and then you have to start preparing for the sport. And if you just think about what I just said, it took us eight weeks, two months to figure out what worked for Jacob, Mm -hmm. right? Like truly work, like the magic that's going to take him to the podium next year. Like we've got that. That's Mm -hmm. so cool. We couldn't have done that without the time that we have now. So in a way, it's a big blessing, right? Um, Now, granted, like, you know, he was in Madison this past weekend and, you know, just he was kind of bummed he's not competing, which is totally understandable. But... Um, the opportunities that we have are, are pretty unique. Right. So, um, in a nutshell, like his training is higher time under tension, using um, tempo to overload certain positions um, that he is not strong in, and then having a higher, um, basically a higher repetition count in his strength work. A lot has to do with when we're putting in breathing work and when we're training, um, what we're training, right? So some people, um, you know, if they're enduring and you need to get threshold work up, some people are like, oh, put that first in the day because that's the most important. But if someone's enduring um, and experiences that, uh, that sort of thing, having lifting first in the day kind of primes the pump to where that threshold work is actually more effective. Um, not necessarily a case with Jacob, but that's just one example of like seeing how all the pieces influence one another is mm-hmm. really, really important. So the keys in the upcoming months are going to be able to replicate that. The next step is replicating that in all of his other lifts, getting like freakishly strong, and then the hard work starts. We're like figuring out like how do we keep that? How do we keep that train going and start introducing his breathing? the Metcons, the volume back in. Um, I mean, the guy's still, I mean, amazing. Like, yeah, I mean, his, his lungs, his threshold work hasn't gone anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and that stuff comes back fairly quick. Right. And so, anyways, that's that's kind of where we're at, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I, I love that The this is probably the third or fourth time that I'm going to bring this book up, but this is what I hear you saying is um, – he's using this, what most people would call a setback, uh, as something to propel him forward. So the book is The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. Great book. And, I, and, and this is a conversation I had with Brooke, like the, the fact that you have to take another year off is it's such a huge opportunity to work on your biggest weakness, which is in between your, your two ears, right? Um, without that, without this challenge you know this this hurdle to step over uh, you might not have had that same opportunity so it's, it's really cool to hear you say that that he's taking that not as something that's holding him back but propelling him even forward and going to add to his success yeah completely so at what point do you switch gears from building that um, that you know structure and, and you know absolute strength to preparing for open and for, for for most people it's the open and then for Jacob preparing for regionals yeah so I think um, it, for him it never really stops and I don't think it should right I think um, you know until his overhead stability outweighs something else we're never gonna stop working on it and and we're always gonna start we're always gonna be working on some of the small pieces in some capacity maybe it does get better than I don't know, whatever else, right? But then we'll start working on those. So I think having, you know, you can think about, like, um, like, right, links in a chain. Uh, You're only as strongest as your weakest one, right? And so um, there is never, um, there is, we never forget about that stuff. We'll always work it in. what changes is um, 
the priorities or those characteristics that are needed in regionals, right? So muscle endurance, threshold work, um, high levels of skill, things like that. And so by taking his absolute strength and really the next steps uh, would be to slowly introduce like uh, zone one work. Uh, Which is what? Like active recovery, easy breathing, like nose breathing only Mm -hmm. work on top of what he's doing right now and seeing if it affects anything. Mm -hmm. If it affects something, then we gotta be like, okay, like what's going on? Uh, It probably won't. And that'll help build an aerobic base to prepare him for muscle endurance down the road. So if that doesn't affect anything, we're like, all right, cool. Like we can take that and we can up it to just like aerobic power work, aerobic work, and start introducing a little bit of muscle endurance, right? And then we ask ourselves, is that affecting anything? Is that Mm -hmm. metabolic damage too much? And then from there, we can go into threshold work and then high level of like repeatability work and and muscle endurance, gymnastics, uh, barbell cycling. And then that'll kind of lead us into lead us into to regionals, give or take Um, all all along testing them. Right. Saying, um, you know, we I have, you know, a handful of like a battery of tests that define where he's at. And so like. Every so often, I give them, give them one and be like, hey, has this gone down or up, right, or stayed the same? And we just want those benchmarks to kind of be in line with what we want happening over the year, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. And a lot has to do with um, what happens a week from now, what happens at the games. Like, if he wants to stand on that podium, well, who ends up on that podium, right? And what characteristics do they possess relative to him? Mm-hmm. Because at his level, it's not that we need to get him better, than himself, we need to get him better than the person next to him. Mm-hmm. And that's a different approach than someone who is looking to get into regionals, right? Someone who's just looking to compete in the open, because that's that's more of an internal, like, I just needed to show up today better than I was yesterday. It's still true to Jacob, but, um, you know, he can out-breathe just about, or most people on the field, right, of his peers. So why do we need to get him better to that? Like, are we going to take the extra time for that? Um, you know, there's there's only so much time in the day, mm-hmm. right? There's only so much you can recover from. So understanding the game, understanding the sport, and who you're competing against is really a big part of how we're going to transition and set up for 2018. And really a lot of that's going to be defined next week. Right. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you look at a... a elite weightlifter and they're they're pumped if they hit a 10 pound pr 15 pound pr over the course of a four-year uh olympic cycle right yeah. so for for an elite crossfit athlete it might look like they maintain their level of fitness in uh all areas but their biggest weakness and then by up in that you know getting rid of that that one weakness that makes the biggest difference yeah i mean you look at um last year at the games right so if you take out Jacob's three biggest um, worst placements, he's on the podium. Mm-hmm. You just cut those in half, and he's on the podium. So um, you know there's there's a there's a point in which you have diminishing returns uh, working on your weaknesses versus working on what you're good at. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a little bit of nuance in there, and um, and then the reality is sometimes you're just guessing and hoping. Like you don't know what's coming out next week right so like I mean is the bike gonna be two hours long I mean you look you look on the the app the CrossFit Games app and that schedule has a two and a half hour block in there yeah on Thursday what the hell is gonna take two and a half hours mm-hmm. right um, is that a logistical thing like they got to run everybody through something it's just they, that's what they're allotting or is it like a marathon right on a bike or 50k on a bike I mean so That's where you're just like, well, I got to make my best prediction, you know, based on what's happened, right? you know, and just say, okay, this is the direction we're going in, right? Love it, man. I can't wait. Anything else you want to leave these guys with? Building strength, programming, coaching, anything? I just say, like, keep it simple in the beginning, right? And, um, you know, take that NME test and and build those protocols, right? So, like, all you need to do is adjust um, if if you end up or you have, let's say you're a coach, right? Let's say you're a coach and ask yourself, is this person enduring or are they powerful? If they're enduring, 
give them more repetitions. Give them more time under tension. Uh, if you don't understand time under tension, you can Google it. You can look at tempo work. Um, but tempo, adding tempo in, is going to up the stress of that movement, right? So enduring people, you need to up the stress. You can either do that through time under tension. You can either do that through repetition. You can do that um, through reduced rest times. But anyways, you need to increase their stress to get that same response. For powerful people, think about managing that so it's just you're not overdosing them. Mm -hmm. And I'd say if you start there, um, making sure that you have adequate rest between what you're training, uh, you you're have a very, very good base to start with. Uh, the second part of that is look at your breathing and your aerobic or your metabolic damage, meaning like if you breathe threshold work, you have a bunch of metabolic damage that's going on. Your body prioritizes the healing and basically the rejuvenation, the, the recovery of that typically over, um, you know, other things. And so if you have too much of it, it could blunt your strength adaptation. So if you're not seeing, you take the first part of that, you run with it, and if you're not seeing uh, gains, look at the amount of breathing you're doing and look at adjusting that. I like how you started it off too with keep it simple. I think uh, for the most part, people need to jump into it and experiment on their own, get their own feedback and do a little bit less reading and researching, right? A yeah. little more doing, a little, little less talking about it and reading about it. Yeah. Because the, the, what's gonna have the biggest impact on your, uh, your knowledge, your comprehension of anything at all is your actual experimentation. Yeah, and just don't try to do too much at once. Mm -hmm. Pick one thing that you want to improve and so go that, for it. So that way you know what is actually yeah. working or what isn't. Totally. And if it works, man, that's like the beginning of a recipe mm -hmm. for what you can hope to be, you know, everything else. Bench right. press, deadlift, squat, like press, overhead pressing, like, you know. Recipes. I think I'm going I'm to call, start calling you Chef Fowler. <laughs> Chef Fowler. Yeah. <laughs> All right, brother. Thank you yeah. so much. This no, thank you. It was good. It was good talking. All right, man. Later. Yeah.